So once glucose undergoes glycolysis in the cytoplasm and produces the pyruvate molecules, in the presence of oxygen, those pyruvate molecules will migrate into the matrix of the mitochondria, and they will move across the membranes of the mitochondria via a special type of membrane protein we call pyruvate translocase. Now what will happen to that pyruvate as soon as it moves into the matrix of the mitochondria? Well, it will not actually enter that citric acid cycle. Before it can enter the citric acid cycle, the pyruvate molecule must be prepared for that citric acid cycle. It must be activated. And that's why a process known as pyruvate decarboxylation actually takes place. Pyruvate decarboxylation, which is catalyzed by a large protein complex known as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, this entire process, it releases a carbon dioxide molecule and attaches a two carbon component of the pyruvate onto a special molecule, a carrier molecule known as coenzyme A or CoA. And we form the cetyl coenzyme A complex. And this activates the two carbon fuel source of that pyruvate so that now we can actually transfer this component into the citric acid cycle. In the process, we also actually abstract two electrons from the pyruvate and those two electrons are picked up by the nicotine and uh, nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide molecule to form NADH. And so this is the net process that we call pyruvate decarboxylation. So this irreversible reaction prepares the pyruvate for the citric acid cycle. It releases a carbon dioxide and abstracts a pair of high energy electrons that are carried by the NAD that are, in that are ultimately used by the electron transport chain to actually generate ATP molecules, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. Now, although this net reaction looks simple, it's not actually that simple. It involves different types of enzymes and also involves different types of steps. And actually, we have four steps in pyruvate decarboxylation and three steps are actually required to form that acetyl coenzyme A complex, as we'll see in just a moment. But before we look at the details of these four steps, let's actually discuss what components we find in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So this complex actually consists of three different enzymes and also uses five different coenzymes. So let's begin by focusing on the enzyme. So enzyme number one known as E1 is pyruvate dehydrogenase and this enzyme actually catalyzes the first step, the decarboxylation step, and the second step, an oxidation reduction step. Now the other enzyme, the second enzyme E2 is known as dihydrolipol transacetylase and what this does is it actually transfers that acetyl group that was formed in the first two steps onto the coenzyme A to form this complex. And in the final step, which is actually catalyzed by E3 dihydrolipol dehydrogenase, this actually reforms the oxidized version of lipoamide, which is basically a coenzyme that is used in this process. And what it also does is it generates the NADH molecule. So what about the five coenzymes that are used by this protein complex? Well, we have thymine pyrophosphate TPP, which is basically used in step one. And this is actually a prosthetic group that is attached onto pyruvate dehydrogenase. And we'll see what it's used for in just a moment. We also have a derivative of lipoic acid known as lipoamide. And we'll talk about what that does in just a moment. And then we have the coenzyme A, which basically acts as the carrier molecule for the cetyl group, the two carbon component that is removed from the pyruvate. The FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, is used to pick up the two electrons and then those two electrons are transferred onto the NAD plus nicotine adenine dinucleotide to form the NADH in the final step as we'll see in a moment. So, Let's begin by summarizing the first three steps of this reaction. Why the first three? Well, because the first three are basically used to form that acetyl coenzyme A complex. So in the first step, 
we have a de uh, we have a decarboxylation reaction taking place in which this entire component not including these two electrons in this bond is basically removed because we want to form the carbon dioxide and we form this intermediate now remember Decarboxylation reactions, like the one shown here, are generally exergonic reactions. They release energy. And that free energy that is released in the decarboxylation process is used to power the other reactions that are endergonic in this particular process. So once we form this intermediate, the two electrons are then abstracted. They're used to actually reduce a molecule as we'll see in just a moment. And that allows us to form this intermediate. And now we can couple this intermediate with coenzyme A to form this acetyl coenzyme A complex. And in the final step, we generate the NADH and we regenerate a coenzyme, the lipoamide that we mentioned just a moment ago. So let's see exactly what that means. Let's begin with step number one. So step number one is catalyzed by pyruvate dehydrogenase and it contains a prosthetic group we call thiamine pyrophosphate TPP. And this enzyme, the E1 enzyme of this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex uses this prosthetic group to actually attach onto that pyruvate molecule and at the same time remove a carbon dioxide. Now this step is not actually a single step. It contains individual steps, but I didn't have space to basically draw the steps out. Uh, so this is what happens. We have the pyruvate and the TPP, and this is actually attached onto the enzyme, the pyruvate dehydrogenase. And what happens is this entire component here is essentially removed. In addition, we have to input two H plus ions. Why? Well, because one of them is used to basically form a hydroxyl group and the other one is attached onto this carbon here. And so once the bond forms between this carbon of the TPP and this carbon here, this is what we form. The complex is known as hyd uh, hydroxyethyl TPP complex or simply hydroxyethyl TPP. And we also generate that carbon dioxide that we have right here. Now, once we form the hydroxyethyl TPP, this same enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, also catalyzes the next step, an oxidation reduction step. Now, what basically happens is, this molecule here is oxidized. So this is the oxidizing agent, while this structure is reduced, so this will act as the reducing agent. And what will happen is electrons will be taken away from this acetyl group here, or it's, it's, it's not actually in its acetyl form just yet, but this purple region will actually will abstract two electrons, will give the electrons onto this component, and in the final step, those electrons that we give to the lipoamide will be taken away and given to the NAD+. So in the second step, we have another important coenzyme, lipoic acid, actually a derivative of lipoic acid known as lipoamide. And so this is what lipoamide looks like. It is also attached onto the, uh, onto the enzyme. In fact, it's attached onto the serine residue of the enzyme. So this entire structure, which is not shown, is actually attached onto the enzyme. And so we take the hydroethyl TPP complex, it reacts with the lipoamide structure, and we form this complex known as acetyl-lipoamide, and we also regenerate the TPP that we began with. Remember, these coenzymes have to be regenerated. So we begin with TPP, and we regenerate that TPP so that in the next cycle, this same molecule can be regenerated used by another pyruvate decarboxylation step. Now let's focus on the C to lipoamide. So essentially what happens is we break the bond and these two electrons take an H atom as shown here. And now this is the cetyl group that is ready to be transferred onto the coenzyme A because ultimately we take this acetyl group off of that pyruvate so this is the same group that we essentially have here 
and this group is now transferred onto the coenzyme A via the third step that is catalyzed by dihydrolipole transacetylase E2. This is the enzyme that catalyzes the transfer of that activated acetyl group onto this molecule here, the coenzyme. Now, once this process takes place and this obtains, so the coenzyme A obtains this structure, we form dihydrolipoamide. And this is not the same structure that we began with here. Notice that in step three, we don't actually regenerate the lipoamide that we used in step two. Unlike in this case, where in step one we used TPP and we regenerated TPP. Here, we began with lipoamide and we ended Ended up with dihydrolipoamide. So even though in step three we actually formed the acetyl coenzyme A structure, we essentially are able to transfer that two carbon acetyl group from the pyruvate and onto that carrier coenzyme A molecule, we did not regenerate the lipoamide. And that's where the final enzyme comes into play. Dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase reforms the oxidized version of lipoamide because remember in this step we actually reduced this structure because two electrons from this molecule were abstracted and given to the lipoamide. And so in the final step we not only regenerate the lipoamide coenzyme that can be then used to restart another cycle of pyruvate decarboxylation, but we also oxidize this molecule, the dihydrolipoamide, take away those two electrons and give those two electrons ultimately onto that NAD to form the NADH that can ultimately be used by the electron transport chain on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So in the final step, we have the flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is actually attached onto the enzyme. This is used to actually oxidize this molecule. What it does is it removes this H along with one electron and this H along with one electron. And we form FADH2. And we finally reform this lipoamide. Essentially one electron here, one electron here, reform that sigma bond that existed between these sulfur groups here. So we reform that lipoamide coenzyme that now can be used to restart this process of pyruvate decarboxylation with another pyruvate molecule. Because remember, we have two pyruvate molecules coming from a single glucose molecule. But we're not done here because this FADH2 in the next step is used to actually transfer those two electrons onto the NAD. And so we have two electrons and a single H atom goes onto the NAD to form NADH and the other remaining H ion no longer contains electrons so it's simply uh, H ion and we form the, uh, the H plus as well as the FAD. Now this step is interesting because it's unlike other steps that take place inside our body because usually it's the NAD that is used to transfer electrons onto the FAD but in this case it's in reverse and the reason is because the FAD is actually activated by attaching itself onto the enzyme and because of that activity because of being activated in that form, it actually does the opposite in this case. It is used to actually give those electrons onto the NAD as well as that H that carries those electrons to form the reduced nicotine amide, nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide molecule that will be used by the electron transport chain to actually generate those ATP molecules. So if we sum up all these three reactions, four reactions, I should say, this is basically what we get. So even though this net equation might seem simple, it actually consists of four different steps. In three steps, we form that acetyl coenzyme A, but the final step is needed to 
not only regenerate that lipoamide coenzyme, but also generate that NADH as well as that H ion. So this is a step by which we essentially prepare that pyruvate molecule. We abstract not only electrons, but the acetyl group from the pyruvate attach it onto the coenzyme A, and that activates this acetyl group, makes it very reactive, and now we can basically take this acetyl and give it to the citric acid cycle.